Donald Trump is blowing hot and cold on joining the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership. Eleven countries, including Australia, Canada, Japan and Mexico, signed up to the TPP in March. Early on Thursday, the American president said he was looking into joining the partnership. But in a later tweet, he appeared to pour cold water on the idea, saying that the U.S. already has bilateral deals with six of the 11 partners and would only join the TPP if the deal was significantly better than that offered to Barack Obama. The Japanese finance minister Taro Aso said he would welcome talks on the U.S. joining, but that renegotiating the deal would be extremely difficult. According to UNICEF, Boko Haram has kidnapped more than a thousand children since 2013. The statement comes on the eve of the four-year anniversary of the Chibok abductions. On April 14, 2014, the insurgency kidnapped over 200 girls from a secondary school. The abduction sparked international outrage, but also led to internal changes in Nigerian politics. A newly elected president began a campaign against Boko Haram, taking the fight to their stronghold in in Sambisa Forest. Following combat operations and negotiations, the Nigerian government secured the release of some, though a hundred girls are still unaccounted for. According to a report by Gizmodo, Singapore plans to launch a pilot program aimed at turning every lamppost in the country, around 110,000, into a wireless sensor network complete with facial recognition cameras. The pilot program, which would appear to confirm the worst fears of privacy advocates, will launch in 2019 as part of the Singapore Smart Nation project. A GovTech spokesperson told Reuters, these capabilities may be used for performance crowd analytics and supporting follow-up investigation in event of a terror incident. However, Gizmodo reports, while often touted as a vital safety measure, privacy experts have expressed grave concerns that the all-seeing eye of surveillance will eventually be used to target political opponents, protesters, and journalists. Ministers assembled at Downing Street for emergency talks on whether to approve taking part in an attack on Syria. The Prime Minister said she believed the Syrian regime was to blame for the poisoning of its people. The international community, she said, must respond. And for the UK, that means joining a US-led coalition against President Assad. Theresa May suggested she's willing to make that move without a vote in Parliament. The government's allowed to take military action without parliamentary backing, but in the past 15 years, successive governments have run major military plans past the House of Commons first. In 2013, Theresa May's predecessor, the then Prime Minister David Cameron, put his case for intervening in Syria in front of Parliament, where it was defeated. A huge blow for him and his government. This time, Theresa May can't risk losing control of her defence and foreign policy plans. But opposition politicians say Parliament must be consulted. There has to be a proper process of consultation. We elect Parliament, we elect members of Parliament, they should have a voice in this. The Cabinet on its own should not be making this decision. Theresa May needs to get this right. Tony Blair's decision to invade Iraq in 2003 cast a long shadow over British politics. The invasion was later found to be based on flawed intelligence. Members of Theresa May's own party are worried it might be too late to get involved. The moment's passed because five years ago, Assad was in a weak position and was vulnerable to Western bombing. The Russians weren't there and there were moderates in the Syrian opposition. There aren't any more. The situation has changed. We're, we're having a meeting. The US president is waging war on Twitter, threatening Assad and his ally Russia. The British government will need to calibrate its response in more measured tones. Neve Barker, Al Jazeera, London. Schools in Pennsylvania London. armed their teachers with baseball bats to be used as weapons against school shooters. The Mill Creek Township School District near the city of Erie handed out 16-inch wooden bats to each of its 500 teachers this week. Superintendent William Hall told local media that bats are to be used only as a last resort. The bats will reportedly remain locked up in each classroom. The district's decision comes in the wake of February's Parkland, Florida high school shooting that left 17 people dead. Many ideas are circulating on how best to protect students. President Donald Trump proposed arming teachers with guns, an option that school safety advocates are firmly against. Another school district in Pennsylvania announced last month it will give teachers buckets of rocks to use against school shooters. 
Many parents within the Mill Creek District say the bats will be as ineffective against an armed attacker as rocks. For United News International... officials think 11 lions found dead at a national park in Uganda were poisoned. The three lionesses and eight cubs were found dead in Queen Elizabeth National Park. Bashir Hangi, a communications officer with the Uganda Wildlife Authority, said April 12th that an investigation is underway and that officials suspect the animals ate meat that was intentionally poisoned. With only around 400 lions in Uganda, Hangi explained the killing of even one is a serious blow to the Ugandan tourism industry. So when someone comes and they kills 11 lions, that person is an enemy of the country. Hangi said the culprits, if caught, will be punished to the fullest extent of the law. According to Deutsche Welle, officials think that lions may have been poisoned by nomadic herdsmen who are trying to protect their livestock. The poisoning of big cats is reportedly becoming more frequent in Ugandan parks. For United News International, say trash in killed a sperm whale that washed ashore a couple of months ago on the southeast coast of Spain. A necropsy revealed the whale, which was found February 27th on a beach in Morsha, had swallowed more than 60 pounds of trash. The garbage included everything from plastic bags and fishing nets to ropes and a plastic drum. Officials said the whale was unable to digest the items, which then caused its digestive system to become inflamed. Plastic continues to pose a major threat to marine life. People produce around 300 million tons of plastic every year. Out of that, more than 8 million tons enter the ocean as trash. The cause of death was announced by officials in Morsha as part of a campaign to raise awareness about plastic pollution and trash in surrounding waters. For United News International, U.S. Special I'm Operations Uni. Forces launched their largest African exercise in Niger amid lingering questions about the U.S. military's role in the West African country. Known as Flintlock 2018, the 10-day exercise kicked off April 11th during an opening ceremony in Niamey. Throughout the exercise, Special Operations Forces will learn to work together to combat extremist groups operating in Africa, including Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, and Boko Haram. About 1,900 service members from 20 African and Western nations are participating in the Flintlock exercise. This year's Flintlock exercise is the first since the October ambush in Niger that left four U.S. and five Nigerian soldiers dead. The incident sparked questions about the extent of U.S. military presence on the continent. Flintlock's location rotates annually and was already planned to be held in Niger before the ambush. For United News International, I'm Mila Uni. According to Gizmodo.com, over 150 experts in AI, robotics, commerce, law and ethics from 14 countries have signed an open letter denouncing the European Parliament's proposal to grant personhood status to intelligent machines. Many technologists have critiqued their actions because they think it's too soon to consider robots people. Still, the EU Parliament believes the best way to control future conflict with human-like technology is with electronic personhood. According to DigitalTrends.com, police in Southeast China have reportedly arrested a fugitive spotted in a crowd of 50,000 people attending a pop concert, thanks to some eerily accurate facial recognition technology. The man was arrested while attending a show by Hong Kong singer Jackie Chung in the Nanchong, Xinghai province. Facial recognition technology is heavily used in Chinese law enforcement. British Prime Minister Theresa May has cleared the path for joining a military attack against Syria after her cabinet back plans to join the U.S. in launching strikes against President Assad's regime. The Prime Minister reportedly received unanimous support for her plans. She later spoke with President Donald Trump who agreed that Assad's use of chemical weapons could not go unchallenged. May will seek to launch airstrikes without first securing parliamentary approval, the BBC reports, in a move which is opposed by Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn and numerous other MPs across the House of Commons. After winning his fourth career gold at the Commonwealth Games, English diver Tom Daly has called for a number of Commonwealth nations to relax their laws on homosexuality. He landed gold on Friday in the men's synchronized 10-meter platform alongside Dan Goodfellow. His thoughts so quickly turned to the 70% of Commonwealth nations where homosexuality is still illegal. Almost all Commonwealth members were once part of Britain's former empire. Home to 2.2 billion people, the Commonwealth is now a voluntary association of 53 sovereign states. The 2018 Games has involved 71 nations and territories. Palestinian medics say 30 people were shot and wounded by Israeli troops on Friday during a large protest on the border with Gaza near the frontier fence. The demonstrators hurled stones and burned flags and tires, but the Israeli military claimed some of the demonstrators threw firebombs and an explosive device. The protests against the annexation of Palestinian ancestral homes by Israel are now in their third week 
and since they started, 30 Palestinians have been shot dead by the Israeli army. Hundreds of others have been wounded. Israel's tactics have drawn international criticism, but an Israeli military spokesman said troops were being confronted by rioters and they were responding in accordance with the rules of engagement. In this sea where so many countries have territorial claims, an unprecedented display of Chinese military power. Images likely to unsettle some of China's neighbors. It was the top story on Chinese state television, running for more than 22 minutes. The fleet review involved 48 warships, a nuclear-powered submarine, and China's sole operating aircraft carrier, the Liaoning. The display also included 76 aircraft, including bombers and fighter planes, as well as 10,000 servicemen and women. Dressed for battle, issuing orders, their commander-in-chief, President Xi Jinping, armed with words for a military he's determined to strengthen. Building a strong navy has never become so urgent as today. We'll carry out the thought of building a strong military in a new era. Just 48 hours earlier, before an audience that included world leaders, President Xi had sought to present China as the guarantor of free trade. Now, in the South China Sea, that contains some of the world's busiest shipping lanes, he had another message. These are our waters, and we have the strength to defend them. The display happened as three Navy U.S. aircraft carrier battle groups passed through these contested waters. China claims almost 90% of the South China Sea and for the past few years has been reinforcing its claim by building artificial islands. It denies they have a military purpose. Some of these warships are now sailing towards the narrow strait that separates China from Taiwan to take part in a live fire drill next Wednesday the first such exercise in more than 20 years. Adrian Brown, Al Jazeera, Now, the U.S. Beijing. hasn't made clear where it may strike in Syria or how, but the American ship, the USS Donald Cook, recently arrived in the eastern Mediterranean Sea. Now, that's joined the guided missile destroyer, the USS Porter. It's capable of firing missiles from hundreds of miles offshore, well out of range of Syrian air defences. Now, last week, aircraft carrier the USS Harry Truman, loaded with strike planes, set sail from the US also to the Mediterranean. And the US has the Al Odeid Air Base in Qatar. There it has stealth F 22 fighter jets, which could be used to evade the Syrian regime's Russian made air defense systems. Now, if the attack takes place, it may be more aggressive and have more international support than the unilateral strike by the US one year ago. That's when its Navy launched 59 cruise missiles from the Mediterranean towards Syria's remote Shirat Air Base. It was in response to another apparent chemical attack on Khan Sheikhoun, another Syrian town held by rebel forces. But let's take a look at Russia's weapons arsenal. From its Latakia base in the west of Syria, it has weapons including the S-400 surface-to-air missiles. Now, these have just over a 300 kilometer range radius and the capability of shooting down missiles launched by the US Navy. So, what could be the new US targets? And the pointing to areas including Dumer, Marj Rahayel, and Meza air bases around Syria's capital, Damascus, which have been instrumental to the Syrian regime's offensive in Eastern Syria. The US Navy is taking a cue from video games, recently landing a fighter jet on the deck of an aircraft carrier using a remote control. Late last month, Navy crew members remotely landed a 40,000 pound jet on the flight deck of the USS Abraham Lincoln. The F-18 Hornet strike fighter had been outfitted for remote operation with a system aptly called Atari, or Aircraft Terminal Approach Remote Inceptor. The system was created in 2016, but before last month's test, Atari had only been tested on land. Using the system, landing signal officers are able to take control of an aircraft from up to five miles away and use a joystick to remotely land the aircraft. 
Researchers say Atari could be used during recovery operations if a pilot is incapacitated, as well as in the future when unmanned aircraft begin to operate from the flight deck. For United News International, Russia has I'm reportedly Lager. been jamming U.S. drones in Syria, further escalating an already tense situation in the region. NBC News reported on Tuesday, April 10th, that the Russian military has deployed jamming tactics against American drones, affecting the U.S. military's ability to operate in the region. According to the report, Russia began jamming U.S. drones several weeks ago by blocking GPS signals, causing the drones to malfunction. Officials suggested that the move was sparked by fears that the U.S. would retaliate after Saturday's chemical attack in Syria. The drones that have been targeted are smaller surveillance drones, not larger ones with strike capability like the MQ-1 Predator or the MQ-9 Reaper. Nonetheless, U.S. military drones are equipped with defenses against electronic countermeasures. Russia's ability to jam U.S. drones suggests that Russian capabilities are more advanced than previously thought. For United News International, U.S. Special I'm Operations Kimberly. Forces launched their largest African exercise in Niger amid lingering questions about the U.S. military's role in the West African country. Known as Flintlock 2018, the 10-day exercise kicked off April 11th during an opening ceremony in Niamey. Throughout the exercise, Special Operations Forces will learn to work together to combat extremist groups operating in Africa, including Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, and Boko Haram. About 1,900 service members from 20 African and Western nations are participating in the flintlock exercise. This year's flintlock exercise is the first since the October ambush in Niger that left four U.S. and five Nigerian soldiers dead. The incident sparked questions about the extent of U.S. military presence on the continent. Flintlock's location rotates annually and was already planned to be held in Niger before the ambush. For United News International, After I'm After months of tough talk on the Iranian nuclear agreement, Donald Trump appears headed for a showdown. The current status of relations between the U.S. and Iran is what? Very acrimonious. President Trump has railed against the nuclear agreement since his campaign. The Iran deal was one of the worst and most one-sided transactions the United States has ever entered into. In January, he doubled down, declining to impose sanctions on Tehran, but only for one last time, he says. Iran is not living up to the spirit of the deal. Unless Iran renegotiates the deal to give the U.S. and its allies greater access to Tehran's facilities and to extend the agreement, Trump says, he will decline to waive sanctions. That could effectively put an end to the nuclear agreement. They've made very clear that if the United States walks away, they would not see themselves as continued to be uh, required to adhere with their own obligations. And so I think we would very likely see Iran begin to reconstitute elements of its nuclear program. So I think it's almost inconceivable that we won't see an escalation of tensions between the two countries. One possible reason for Trump's newly hard line, domestic U.S. politics. The president is pivoting to a hard line in large part because he's heading into the midterm elections and the poll numbers don't look good. Republicans in general, and the White House in particular, are sweating bullets, and Trump's going back to his game plan as a candidate, and that is to go to the hard right and to rally the base. Personnel changes at the White House could make all the difference. Trump recently replaced advisors who want to keep the deal intact with hardliners who want to scrap it. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster are out. Mike Pompeo and John Bolton are in. Bolton has gone so far as to call for regime change in Iran and military strikes on its nuclear program, leaving Trump in something of an echo chamber with few dissenting voices remaining. John Hendren, Al Jazeera, Washington. North Korea is denouncing a new American nuclear strategy that calls for the U.S. to enhance its arsenal of low-yield nuclear weapons. A spokesperson for the North Foreign Ministry's Institute of American Studies says the U.S. strategy is a declaration of war against the world. As part of our defense, we must modernize and rebuild our nuclear arsenal, hopefully never having to use it but making it so strong and so powerful that it will deter any acts of aggression by any other nation or anyone else. Yeah. 
Perhaps someday in the future, there will be a magical moment when the countries of the world will get together to eliminate their nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, we are not there yet. North Korea is denouncing a new American nuclear strategy that calls for the U.S. to enhance its arsenal of low-yield nuclear weapons. A spokesperson for the North Foreign Ministry's Institute of American Studies says the U.S. strategy is a declaration of war against the world. As part of our defense, we must modernize and rebuild our nuclear arsenal, hopefully never having to use it but making it so strong and so powerful that it will deter any acts of aggression by any other nation or anyone else. Yeah. Perhaps someday in the future, there will be a magical moment when the countries of the world will get together to eliminate their nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, we are not there yet.